in the heart of the Scottish Highlands lies the most famous lake on Earth, Loch Ness. Tales of a monster have haunted these dark waters for nearly 1,500 years. Yet in the last century, the reports have intensified with over a thousand recorded sightings. My gut feeling is that the vast majority of witnesses are sincere. Mysterious objects have been caught on camera, along with unexplained sonar targets. This thing is clear, it's stark, it's challenging. This thing is not a mistake. But is it a monster? A case of mistaken identity? Or something else? Now the most detailed study of eyewitness reports ever undertaken exposes the truth behind the Loch Ness phenomenon. That provides the key to fully understanding the Loch Ness story. cold, forbidding waters of Loch Ness have become a global obsession. For centuries, people have claimed a monstrous creature lurks in its depths. Known as Nessie, it continues to defy freezing conditions and treacherous terrain to challenge scientists and enthusiasts to explain it. Well, I've certainly got the Nessie bug. I, I can't deny that. Retired engineer Gordon Holmes has spent the past decade searching for Nessie. For years, he has scanned the waters by day. Now, suspecting the creature may be nocturnal, he searches at night. There's no reason why Nessie should be a, an office staff hours monster, but instead could be, you know, a 10 o'clock to 6 o'clock in the morning monster. You know, nobody knows, so it's certainly worth an investigation. Gordon scours the loch, hoping to catch a glimpse of the monster. He believes he's already seen it, when it surfaced briefly one evening. I saw something coming towards me about 200 yards out. It looked incredibly aerodynamic. I still don't know what I saw on that night of the 26th of May 2007. Monster sightings on Loch Ness date all the way back to the 6th century, when St. Columba, who is said to have introduced Christianity to Scotland, rescued a man from the monster's jaws. In the centuries that followed, reports of a large, unidentified creature in Loch Ness poured in from witnesses from all walks of life. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It came up and went down again. Now, half a second before, I wasn't a believer in the Loch Ness monster, and half a second later, I was. So what is the truth behind these extraordinary claims? Despite 80 years of searching the loch, no hard evidence has been uncovered. Now, the quest for Nessie has taken an entirely new scientific approach, led by statistical ecologist Dr. Charles Paxton. My gut feeling is that the vast majority of witnesses are sincere. My job as a scientist is to try and work out what they actually did see and what that could represent. As part of an epic three-year investigation, Paxton has analyzed thousands of eyewitness accounts, hoping to find the key missing evidence behind the mystery. No one has ever considered looking at the Loch Ness Monster phenomena in this way before, and so therefore it offers a great opportunity to really understand the underlying signal in the data. For the first time, this unique analysis will enable experts in all fields to scientifically interpret the eyewitness evidence. As the results come in, a pattern immediately leaps out of the data. Here we've got a graph of when people said that they encountered the Loch Ness Monster. And we can see very few sightings coming up um, to the period of 1930-1933. And then in 1933, the number of encounters massively increases. The 1933 peak coincides with the opening of the A82 along the loch's northern shore. The improved road not only made Loch Ness more accessible, but tree felling for its construction left an unobstructed view and sightings of Nessie rocketed. But what were they seeing? 
I've got my own ideas about what the data says, but I'd be really intrigued to find out what experts like Adrian Shine, how they interpret the data. Naturalist Adrian Schein has been studying Loch Ness for the last 41 years. He's led numerous scientific investigations into its zoological secrets. This is arguably the most famous lake in the world, but it isn't necessarily the best understood. And therein, of course, lies the mystery. To understand the mystery, Schein believes first you have to understand the loch itself. Now it lies within the great Glen fault line of Scotland which cuts the highlands in two. You can see it on any map. And because it's a fault line, Loch Ness has some special characteristics. It's long and straight and narrow and it's deep. It's very deep. The loch is enormous, holding more water than all the lakes in England and Wales combined. Enough to submerge every human being on Earth three times over. So there's room for a few mysteries. And this is, after all, dragon country. Look at the surrounding hills. Look at the dark water stained by the peat bogs. It's a hostile place. It's a sort of a lost world. But could the vast black depths of Loch Ness hide a large unidentified species? Lake monsters have ancient roots in Highland folklore. For centuries, tales of a water horse or demon were used to explain drownings or to keep children away from the water's edge. But Paxton's database reveals an event at Loch Ness in July 1933, which transformed the legend into a modern phenomenon. It was the experience of an English couple called the Spicers, which really turned water horses into something prehistoric. Driving home along the edge of the loch, George Spicer and his wife found their way blocked by something truly inexplicable. Mr. Spicer saw, crossing the road in front of him, a long-necked creature, which he said uh, resembled a dinosaur. The Spicer's sighting marked a turning point. The water horse of ancient folklore died and the modern myth of a long-necked prehistoric monster was born. Loch Ness, on which the eyes of the world are focused, the reputed haunt of a prehistoric monster or monsters, and the newly found adventure ground of modern Gullivers. Big game hunters arrived with harpoon guns, and Nessie fever reached new heights, when the enterprising circus owner Bertram Mills put up £20,000 reward, over half a million pounds in today's money, if anyone could capture the creature. The hunters went home empty-handed. But in April 1934, a London surgeon captured the next best thing. This iconic image taken in 1934 was hailed as the first hard evidence of an unknown, long-necked creature in Loch Ness. The public demanded an explanation no living aquatic species fitted the bill. In fact, only one animal in evolutionary history did. A 40-foot marine predator with a neck over half its body length. The plesiosaur. This is a really splendid specimen of a plesiosaur. It was dug out of a clay pit in, in Britain in the early years of the 20th century. And in many ways, it epitomizes people's image of the Loch Ness Monster. Plesiosaurs not only fitted witness descriptions like the spices of a long neck, but were common in the warm tropical seas surrounding Scotland 160 million years ago. You see, there's nothing like it in today's world. This, as it was described by an early paleontologist, a snake threaded through a turtle. Above everything, it isn't so much the humped back, it's only one hump after all, it is this long neck, which was seen as sinuous and flexible, and indeed seen as the diagnostic uh, factor 
in the surgeon's photograph, the one that would be recognized throughout the world as the Loch Ness Monster. With new discoveries challenging scientific knowledge in the early 20th century, the idea of a living plesiosaur seemed increasingly plausible. In 1922, an expedition in search of a plesiosaur was launched in Patagonia. They didn't find one, but in 1977, a group of Japanese fishermen hauled up what appeared to be a 33-foot plesiosaur carcass. The director of the Tokyo National Science Museum described the creature as a reptile, and a scientist at Yokohama National University concluded plesiosaurs must still roam the seas off New Zealand. However, after months of testing, it was finally identified as a decomposing basking shark. We're fascinated with the idea of prehistoric creatures, and they are more plausible in lost worlds, in accessible environments, yetis in the Himalayan snows, sasquatches in the North American woods. Loch Ness is a lost world because it's so deep and dark. Plesiosaurs were thought to have died out with the dinosaurs, but it wouldn't be the first time a prehistoric creature turned up alive and well in the 20th century. The six-foot coelacanth was presumed extinct for the last 65 million years, until a fisherman caught one in 1938. And the megamouth shark, discovered in Hawaii in 1976, was so ancient, scientists had to create an entirely new family and genus of shark. There are creatures which the reports are received with skepticism and turn out to be real. And an example was the uh, creature with an antelope's head and the backside of a zebra. And it turned out to be an okapi. So sometimes these anecdotes, as science would see it, can be seen to have a real foundation. Reports of giant squid and kangaroos were both initially dismissed as mythical, until hard evidence like a skeleton proved otherwise. It's now estimated 86% of species on Earth are still unknown to science. Although most of these are insects, Charles Paxton's previous work suggests monstrous unknown species could still be out there. My first investigation was an investigation of the discovery rates of giant marine animals greater than seven foot long. And at first we discover animals at a very rapid rate. And as time progresses, we find fewer and fewer large animals. Whilst the graph is flattening off, it hasn't completely flattened off, indicating there still could be animals awaiting discovery by science. Paxton's analysis suggests up to 10 creatures larger than seven foot long may still lurk beneath the waves. Could a Loch Ness plesiosaur be next? The surgeon's photo seemed to suggest so. The surgeon's photograph shows a long, upraised, swan-like head and neck. And that is the picture which has always associated Loch Ness monsters with plesiosaurs. The photograph certainly looked like a plesiosaur, and it bore a striking resemblance to the creature described by the spices. But a closer look at the plesiosaur's anatomy reveals a major hitch. The real problem lies in these neural spines, the spinous processes, the lumps on top of the spine. If the plesiosaur is bending its head down, as in the case of this specimen, there's no problem. These lumps move apart. But if it were to attempt to raise its head and neck, they would lock together and prevent any further movement up. So, the diagnostic feature of the surgeon's picture and of the sightings of upraised head and necks are portraying the one thing that a plesiosaur could not do. The loch's freezing temperatures and meager fish stocks shed further doubt on the plesiosaur theory. One of the problems with monsters in Loch Ness is um, 
what about a menu for a monster? What would they eat, especially a viable breeding population, which has been suggested, for example? Well, the problem is the loch is very unproductive. It's surrounded by very hard ancient rock, yielding very few of the chemical fertilizers like nitrates and phosphates to the water, which start the food chain off with the microscopic plants which feed the microscopic animals, which feed the fish, which feed the monsters if they are there. So what had the surgeon captured on film? Forensic image expert Mike Hartzell has been trying to find out. I'd only seen this image until quite recently, which is quite well cropped. And if you look at the larger image, where it came from, then my eyes certainly start to ring some alarm bells. It does tend to suggest this is a smaller object that's quite close to the camera, rather than a larger object that's further away. The surgeon, Dr. Robert Wilson, claimed to have taken the image from a distance of 400 yards. But the ratio of the ripple ellipses reveals the camera angle to the horizon is 19 degrees. As Wilson's camera was no more than four feet above the lock, the monster couldn't have been more than 12 feet away. Something doesn't add up. Adrian Shine did some investigating of his own and discovered just how big Wilson's Loch Ness monster really was. So it isn't that difficult to demonstrate that the surgeon's photograph can be a very small object if you don't have cues to distance. After 60 years as the face of Nessie, a model maker called Christian Sperling finally admitted the photograph was a hoax. He and his stepfather attached a model neck to a toy submarine and photographed it in only a few feet of water before giving the plates to Dr. Wilson to develop. Here we are, the surgeon's photo monster. That's all you need, provided you can remove the cues to scale. Hoax or not, Sperling's image of Nessie had a decisive effect on the national consciousness, and eyewitness reports continued to flood in. But what were they seeing? The hunt for Nessie was about to get scientific. Paxton's database reveals that by 1962, nearly 700 reports had been made. Politician David James called for a serious study and established the Loch Ness Phenomena Investigation Bureau. So began a decade of scientific surveillance, with teams of volunteers watching the lock with cameras, as well as collecting statements from witnesses. The Bureau failed to find a monster, but 40 years on, their meticulously detailed eyewitness archive has proved invaluable to Charles Paxton's modern-day analysis. This is a tremendous resource for anybody wanting to study um, Loch Ness Monster reports. They're first-hand accounts, you know, the very best accounts that we can have. These are the actual words and handwriting of, of the witness. These unique documents are the keystone of Charles Paxton's database and enable him to identify common features within the reports. Whilst we've got all these very, very different reports, some of them have common features. And it's those common features that have been brought out in the analysis. By far the most common category is a single dark hump often described as being looking like an upturned boat. Probably the second most common category is seeing multiple dark humps. Adrian Schein believes the humped monsters hark back to another ancient mythical creature seen for centuries by sailors. We're talking about humps. And inevitably, that brings me to thinking about the sea serpent form of Loch Ness Monster, which is a row of multi-humps. Throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, Mariners returned with similar tales of multi-humped serpent-like monsters reaching hundreds of feet in length. The 30-foot oarfish is the only known species that comes close to their descriptions. But even these deep-sea giants can't undulate their body to create humps. So what was the truth behind the sea serpent seen on Loch Ness? A 
closer look at Paxton's analysis holds a vital clue. Sightings of multi-humped monsters on Loch Ness only tend to appear in calm weather. And in still conditions, another surface phenomena becomes highly noticeable. Dr. Tom Davy manages the flow wave test tank at Edinburgh University. Waves can combine to produce quite complex shapes. You can get quite uh, surprising shapes forming, even if they only exist for a brief period of time. Flowwave's 10 million pound wave lab is one of the most sophisticated on Earth. The unique circular system is capable of replicating the conditions for almost any wave at 1 20th the scale. This facility has been uh, constructed primarily to look at behaviours in real ocean conditions. Uh, today we're going to do something a bit different and perhaps look at what may have been observed in Loch Ness. One of the factors contributing to bizarre wave formations on Loch Ness is its geological profile. The steep rocky sides encourage waves to be reflected in different directions. Waves from multiple directions can combine to produce uh, particularly large waves. In a lab we choose exactly when we're going to generate these waves and we determine where they're going to focus. In nature they wouldn't get exactly the shape we see here but the similar physics apply. Merging waves from different directions can result in surprising formations. Even combining just two waves can give rise to strange humped shapes. So if we have waves from opposite directions, we can build up a standing wave through a sequence of humps, which appear to stay still. Here we have two identical waves coming at exactly 90 degrees, and where the crests uh, combine, we get these humps forming. And the relative motion of them, as well, uh, goes from right to left. You could get this over a small area, for example, if you had uh, two boat wakes combining. For Adrian Shine, the humped shapes created at Flow Wave are all too similar to the sea serpent-shaped monsters described on Loch Ness. Multi-humped sea serpents in Loch Ness are boat wakes. Simple as that. The boat wakes have been there since 1820. But only after the idea of sea serpents in Loch Ness would they be perceived as sea serpents. The multi-humped monsters finally have an explanation. But hundreds of other sightings remained inexplicable. We saw this great neck emerge from the water. I saw the head, the neck, and the huge body, which I'd say was about 30 feet long. To get to the truth, investigators would have to venture beneath the loch's deceptive surface. In the 1960s, a decade of surface surveillance on Loch Ness failed to find evidence of the elusive monster. But eyewitness reports of a mysterious creature continued driving the mystery. As the 70s dawned, investigators took the scientific quest for Nessie to a deeper level beneath the dark, forbidding surface of the loch. Veteran Loch Ness investigator Adrian Shine was among them. That's where the underwater cameras came in, the submarines came in. I can think of all sorts of weird and wonderful things that were tried. Capture techniques, great cages were built, baiting of different sorts was tried. One enthusiast even hired a perfumer to concoct a scent to attract the creature. Just about anything you could think of has actually been tried. Then finally in 1972 there appeared to be a breakthrough. We feel so strongly with regard to the reality of what we have to warn the Scottish authorities and the British authorities to look carefully into the matter of conservation and protection of the environment so that we think is the tenth wonder of the world, if you will. Using a remotely controlled underwater camera, an expedition by the American Academy of Applied Science claimed to have captured images of a plesiosaur-shaped creature. The extraordinary photographs seemed to describe a flipper, a gargoyle's head and a whole plesiosaur. The images were presented to the House of Commons and published in scientific journals. But for some, they seem too good to be true. Can Dr. Rhymes give us an absolute guarantee that there is no hoaxing about this? Absolutely. This image of a flipper, estimated at being over two meters long, 
led to the naming of the monster as the rare species Nessitaris rhomboptrix, the diamond-finned monster of Ness. The original photograph had been enhanced by photographic specialists to reduce its graininess. Yet despite using the latest technology, forensic image analyst Mike Hartzorn struggles to reproduce their image. There's the original image. Um, I, I dropped a lot of the green in order to get some contrast. I then increased the, the, the mid-range greys and stuff to try and bring out the, the, the image that you can see. And once I've cropped and rotated it to match their image, that's as good as I could get using the best kit we've got in 2014. Mike believes there is only one way to get this flipper from the original photograph. I've literally used a paintbrush tool to try and make it look more like this. Which really leads me to believe that maybe they used something more arty than enhancement. There is a well-known question, where does enhancement finish and drawing start? Further controversy arose when a London paper pointed out that the name Nessitaris Rhomboptrix, given by Sir Peter Scott, was also an anagram for monster hoax by S. Finally, in 1989, the man behind the original enhancement, Charles Wyckoff, confessed that the edges that make the image so unmistakably a flipper were never evident in his original analysis. Someone had drawn them on after the image was submitted for publication. Who was responsible remains a mystery. But psychologist Chris French believes that the 70s hoax highlights the brain's susceptibility to see what it expects to see. I think this is a wonderful illustration of the way that we can actually find meaning and pattern when we're actually looking at something that's essentially random. I mean, I'm pretty sure that if you were to show that photograph to a naive subject, nobody would actually say that's anything to do with the Loch Ness Monster. It's just a kind of a meaningless blur. Our pattern-seeking brains find meaning everywhere from the moon to the surface of Mars. Once you say Loch Ness Monster, yeah, you can kind of see a monster-type shape there. This is the body, the long neck and a head here. I mean, the fact there's a gap there, but we automatically fill in those gaps. That's the way that kind of perception works. But without the context, it's not very strong evidence at all. I mean, I'm not convinced. I have to say, I'm just not convinced. Tree trunks and clouds of silt on the loch bed are a more likely source for the ambiguous images. I couldn't believe that a House of Commons presentation had just taken place on the basis of pictures which were lumps of mud and debris. So there have been milestone moments, but in each case the result in the end was disappointment. The influence of psychology in the Loch Ness mystery doesn't stop with visual interpretation. Eyewitness evidence points to a far more personal and deep-rooted issue with our memory. I strongly suspect that the vast majority of people who claim that they have seen the monster are 100% sincere in making that claim, but just being honest doesn't make it necessarily true and accurate. Eyewitness testimony continues to be the strongest evidence for Nessie, but it also highlights our susceptibility to collective false memory. One striking example of the way that memory can fill people is the number of New Yorkers who claim that they directly witnessed the planes smashing into the Twin Towers. It's just unfeasibly large. What's happened, of course, is that we're all familiar with the, the images from that awful disaster. That if you actually live in New York, it would appear feasible that maybe you did actually directly witness it. Chris and his colleague Fiona Gabbert are conducting an experiment to understand how false memory may play a role in the Loch Ness mystery. We ran a study today looking at the suggestibility of memory. We brought two people in and we showed them a mock crime event that was a robbery. Gloria, Gloria and Lucy. And what we didn't tell our real participants was that the person that they were working with was in fact a stooge. Hi, Gloria. Hi, Gloria. Pleasure. I showed them the video of the robbery and they both sat next to each other and encoded that. Oh, 
Then they discussed their memories together about what they could remember seeing. The yeah. other one had one of those masks with, yeah, a with, hole, with yeah. eye holes in it. And the one with the hat had... After a five-minute discussion, the participant is asked to recall exactly what they remember seeing as accurately as possible. Were there any weapons involved? Um, yeah, there was a gun. I think one of them had a gun, just like a handgun. And the slightly taller, skinny one had a uh, leather jacket on. Okay. What was the employee doing throughout the whole thing? Like second shelves. But despite the confidence of their claims, none of these events actually occurred. There was no gun, no leather jacket, no owner stacking shelves. Yet within five minutes of watching the event, 75% of participants were convinced they saw something that wasn't there. Why? He was definitely wearing like a, like a black yeah, leather jacket. Yeah, something black. Yeah. yeah. What did the robber by the door have in his hand? Um, he had the gun. Yeah. Yeah. The study that we ran today found that a large majority of our participants were really easily misled, not just about one thing, but sometimes they reported a number of things that we know that they didn't actually see themselves. And so it is a great demonstration of how suggestible our memories are. I think that's probably quite surprising to the general public because most people really do believe that our memories operate like a video recorder. The research suggests that our memories are profoundly affected by information unconsciously absorbed from outside influences. It's very applicable to then think about what kind of memory errors might be happening at Loch Ness um, for people. They know exactly what that monster should look like. They've got a lot of visual imagery that they can very easily access when they're interpreting something and actually develop this false memory in the same way as our participants. It casts a serious doubt on the validity of eyewitness accounts. Yet Paxton's data reveals that eyewitness recollections are surprisingly consistent over time. My expectation was that as time progressed, if people were reporting a monster they saw 30 years ago, it would become bigger, it would become closer. But you don't see this pattern in the data. This, for me, remains a mystery of the Loch Ness Monster. I need more evidence to convince me that Nessie's actually real, as much as I want to believe Nessie's real. But by the 1980s, there was still one further angle to explore in Loch Ness. This time, using an unbiased piece of technology, that couldn't be manipulated. Sonar. With the advances in technology throughout the 1960s and 70s, sonar expeditions became increasingly common on Loch Ness. By the beginning of the 1980s, over half of all sonar searches had returned with large, unexplained targets. Were these proof of a monster or simply false data? With a decade of Loch Ness expeditions already under his belt, no one was more qualified to investigate than Adrian Schein. Because it was a category of evidence that was unexplained, it was part of my duty to attempt to resolve it. But it was very difficult to work out whether the contacts were truly moving, in other words, animate. Sonar detects objects in the water through the echoes of sound waves reflected off them. The temperature inversions and reflections off the sides of the loch can confuse the picture, making it impossible for a single boat to determine if a target is moving or still. Adrian's solution was bold and ambitious, but he hoped it would finally reveal if there was a large creature swimming in Loch Ness. So what did we do? We got ourselves a fleet of echo sounders and we made a sonar curtain with a fleet of vessels and moved from one end of the loch to the other. It had the smell of decision about it, the inescapable wall of sound. Operation Deep Scan, the largest sonar investigation in the loch's history. Each echo sounder was calibrated to only detect objects bigger than the largest fish. If there was a monster in Loch Ness, Deep scan would find it. I had 120 crew in my fleet, but there were 326 accredited press, so the world waited. The results were fascinating. Deep scan detected three moving targets, inferred by sonar experts as being of a size smaller than a whale but larger than a shark. 
the issue is, of course, what are they? I don't actually know. Now, that doesn't mean they're Loch Ness monsters. It simply means that I don't understand them. The deep scan objects remain a mystery. In 2006, an explanation for Nessie took a new twist when historian Albert Jack put forward a radical new theory claiming he had finally uncovered the source for many of the descriptions of Nessie found in Charles Paxton's database during the peak years in 1933 and 34. Albert believes he can finally reveal what the exotic beast was. He's come to Woburn Safari Park to see it for himself. There's the history side of life and kings and queens and wars and castles and plagues and, and, and all of that that we learn at school. But then there's the other side, isn't there? There's the legends and the myths and the finding out the truth. And so for the first time, I get a chance to look at the theories I've had about the Loch Ness Monster and hopefully we'll find out how close I was to the truth. There must be some known biological explanation for all of the sightings. That particular lock has been searched so many times, but yet no bone, tooth, claw, skin, hair, nothing that can be DNA tested and proven to be from an unknown species. Albert believes the monster so many people witnessed was a creature no one would ever expect to see in a Scottish lock. Yet Paxton's database is riddled with clues to its true identity. Don't they look fantastic? You can see the skin, it looks exactly like so many of the, the descriptions we've had from the 1930s and 1940s of the Loch Ness Monster. Imagine this, if you were five, six hundred yards away, and it's a dim, dull evening, sun's going down, you would never tell the difference. But continents away from its natural habitat, how could an elephant have ended up in Loch Ness? Albert believes the answer lies with the intrepid showman Bertram Mills. Bertram Mills was a very well-known circus entrepreneur um, that I was able to trace Bertram Mills' circus to Inverness during the very same years that the all-important A82 road was first opened that ran alongside the, the lock. And that, of course, coincided with an increase in sightings. Mills was one of the first to introduce circus elephants to Scotland. But he also took an active interest in the Loch Ness myth offering a reward big enough to bankrupt him to anyone who captured the beast. But was he really being reckless? We know we had elephants during 1933 and 1934 up at Inverness as part of the circus, and it's documented that you used to bathe them in the lock. Newspaper reports confirm Mills bathed circus creatures in Loch Ness. And although there is no evidence that this included his elephants, the activity is well documented elsewhere, like in the sea at Blackpool and the river at Lymington Spa. The humps, the neck, the skin and gigantic size. Is it feasible visitors to Loch Ness were simply seeing Bertram Mill's elephants going for a swim? These factors come together for me to create a myth that has since grown and grown and developed and gone off in different directions for sure, but began there. But it's a theory with its own problems. Elephant bathing in public was usually done as a publicity stunt rather than in secret. And Bertram Mill's elephants failed to account for reports of monsters dating back hundreds of years. But out the sightings could have given birth to the collective Nessie myth that persists today. The myth continues. There is something else that's coming to replace it. We need to find out what that is. In 2007, a new piece of evidence was brought to the table that would further help explain the mystery. On the 26th of May 2007, the incredible stamina of Nessie hunter Gordon Holmes finally paid off when he captured this extraordinary video of something moving on Loch Ness. I saw something coming towards me um, about 200 yards out from this position. I zoomed in and whatever it was, it looked incredibly aerodynamic. It, it, it was, I reckon, at one or two foot above the water. It was moving at such a speed that the water was flowing over it. Clearly not an elephant, boat wake or image manipulation. It's one of the most compelling videos of Nessie ever recorded. Forensic image expert Mike Hartshorn has been trying to determine what it shows. 
once I stabilized it, I was able to grasp a lot more how this object moves. You can see that it's a dark object that is moving against the waves, definitely quite sizable, and moving in an animated way under its own steam. Further analysis reveals an even bigger surprise, one that could explain some of the sightings recorded in the 1930s. If you look carefully in the background, there's what seems to be a second line. I've put some highlights around so you can see it. And there it is. So, if it is Nessie, Nessie's got a friend. The new statistical database reveals that the average estimate for the length of Nessie is 16 foot. But the loch's largest native species are otters and arctic char. However, Adrian Schein knows one feature of the loch that could provide an answer. He's heading down the river Ness to its ultimate source. It's often thought that Loch Ness is cut off from everything else, um, but it isn't. It's connected to the sea by the seven mile long river Ness. Many people have suggested that a giant sea creature may have found its way into the loch from the deep sea. But Adrian Schein suspects something more familiar is behind many of the sightings. Seals have, we now know, got into Loch Ness. In 1985, uh, a common seal did get into Loch Ness, was photographed, and in many years since then, we've had either common or grey seals in the loch. Seals feeding on salmon can be lured into Loch Ness during the annual salmon run. Now, they could account for some of the sightings, particularly the sort of single hump sightings. There have been some of uh, a Labrador dog-like head. Uh, that would be most likely a common seal. And there have been land sightings as well, sometimes in the dark of these things hauling themselves across the road in front of pony carts and things like that. Could Gordon Holmes' video have captured a pair of seals? He's certainly open to the idea. People suggested it could be a seal. There was a report within a, a year or two of my sighting that there, were, there was two seals loose in the lock, uh, which just put a kind of question mark on it. And Holmes may not be the first person to confuse seals with Nessie. It could have happened back in the 1930s too. They could be candidates, and I believe probably were in 1934 because there were some reports of seals at the very time when some of the classic monster sightings occurred. The idea of a marine connection for the Loch Ness Monster is tempting uh, for those who still regard the eyewitness testimony as uh, highly convincing. If large creatures unusual to Loch Ness are seen in Loch Ness then I would have to look to the sea. Seals, elephants and boat wakes may have contributed to the Loch Ness phenomena, but they still only tell part of the story. To fully understand the Loch Ness mystery, we need to look elsewhere. Not in the deep black waters of the loch, but in the murky depths of our subconscious and our desire to believe. This really could be crucial in terms of providing the key to explaining what's behind the story of the Loch Ness Monster. Using Charles Paxton's unique statistical analysis, psychologist Dr. Chris French thinks he's finally figured out the main culprit driving the mystery. And the clue lies in a paranormal phenomena a world away from Loch Ness. In 1978, UFO sightings in the UK soared immediately after the release of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. They peaked again following the X-Files in 1998. Looking at the pattern of monster sightings in Loch Ness, Chris sees the same process is at work. Looking at this graph, the first thing that, that 
hits you is this huge peak in the early 1930s. You had the release in 1933 of King Kong, a massively successful film. There's a scene in that where King Kong is fighting with a plesiosaur-like dinosaur, which I'm sure would have had a, had a massive influence in terms of providing the kind of basic imagery for people to think about when they think they've seen something in the log. George Spicer, the first man to see a prehistoric monster in Loch Ness, even compared it to the creature he had just seen in King Kong. From the 1930s onwards, monster imagery in popular culture appears to repeatedly influence the sightings on Loch Ness. Most notably of all, there was the, the famous surgeon's photograph, and that's provided the kind of archetypal image for the, of the Loch Ness monster. So, I think that peak there corresponds beautifully to that. Not surprisingly, we look then, in the, the kind of World War II period, people were preoccupied with other things. There are not going to be so many sightings. Peace sees the return of Nessie, and in the 1960s, sightings peak once again, following the release of the film The Giant Behemoth, and an influential book that detailed over a hundred monster sightings. And there was also the, the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau, so suddenly, the whole idea of the Loch Ness Monster takes on this kind of air of scientific respectability. That very much supports the notion that Nessie is actually a kind of product of culture rather than a, an actual living creature in Loch Ness. But despite French's analysis, people like Gordon Holmes still cling to the possibilities of the unexplained. Do we want a solution? Do we want to be able to nail the Loch Ness Monster and say this is what it is or this is what it is not, it doesn't exist, one or the other? The element of mystery, perhaps we should leave it as things are and allow that mystery to continue. And the fact remains that despite two centuries of scientific investigation, statistically a number of giant creatures of the deep still await discovery. In a shrinking world, and one that we think we understand more and more, we'd like to think there was something fiercer and worse than we are. So has the mystery finally been solved? Does the answer lie not beneath the waters of Loch Ness, but deep in our collective psychology? The truth is that it's actually telling us much more about ourselves, about our own psychology, about human nature, than it is about the Loch Ness Monster. And I mean, they used to say on the X-Files that the truth is out there. Well, I think that the real answer is that the truth's up here. Whatever the reality, for the millions of believers, Loch Ness's famous monster will live on. Kaz is alive, and in their hunt for him, Paul and Sandra discover more bodies in a new show home. Witnesses, coming up now.